Okay, welcome back. Um, so I wanted to start today by finishing up with our decision tree construction from last time. So at the end of last class, we got this far with the construction of our decision tree. Um, and I thought we weren't gonna finish, but actually there's only one more step. So let's just finish this decision tree. Um, can anyone tell me where would we likely split on this sub data set. There's, as a reminder, we're predicting hurricane. Yes, hurricane or no hurricane. And we've already split on humid. So now there's two input features left. There's whether it's rainy, yes or no. And there's the temperature. I think this one you could kind of eyeball to see. I guess a hint, recall that the reason we stopped and predicted no hurricane when humidity is no is because whenever humidity is no, hurricane was also no. So we could just stop there. Do you see anything like that for this remaining part of the data set? Yeah, and what, which, uh, what would we split on for temperature? Yeah, we could split on 18. Um, la yeah, we could do the average between s 7 and 18, which would give us 12.5. And so our final decision tree, without doing all the math, just kind of eyeballing it, is, we'll just draw it again, humid. Yes, no, and if it's no, we output no hurricane. That's the same as what we have already seen. And when it's yes, we can check is the temperature less than, and here we're gonna notice that in the remaining data set, there's this one data point that has hurricane equals no, and these three which have hurricane equals yes. So if we split in the middle, or temperature being less than 12.5, then we can split our data into the final category. So if, notice that when, it, when temperature is less than 12.5, hurricane is always no. When temperature is greater than 12.5, Hurricane is always yes. So we can finish up the construction of our decision tree. Are you taking the average there instead of just the 18 because you don't really know like when it's gonna shift from no to yes? Yes, it just adds a little bit of robustness. Got it. And you could do three at a time instead of two. Sure. Okay. So here we're doing output no hurricane. And in this case, we can output hurricane because, oh, I wrote yes twice, but I think you know what I meant, but just to be clear, output hurricane. And that's our final decision tree. So we've walked through the entire decision tree construction process. It turns out that the decision tree that you construct in homework three is roughly this level of complexity. So even though you have to do it through hand on the homework, it's not any more complicated than this. If it is more complicated, you're doing something wrong. Um, so yeah. Um, any questions on construction of a classification decision tree? Okay. Um, so one cool thing about decision trees is that they can learn complex nonlinear separating boundaries. And it's kind of intuitive to see why, but let's draw it out. So decision trees can learn complex non-linear 
separating boundaries. And to see why this, that's the case, let's just look at a simple example of a two-feature input space, so x1 and x2, and with two categories of data points, and maybe they overlap like that. So that's one category of data points, and the other category is like that. And so what a decision tree does is it splits each data point. So for example, you might do the first split on x2 over here, and now you've split the data into these halves. And then if you look at the upper half, you can split that into here, and we might end up at a leaf node on the right side for the blue x category. And then within the other part, we might split it again and end up in two leaf nodes. Going back up to the root node of the tree, we look at the other side of it, so the bottom half of that plane. We could yeah, split it again here. That takes us to a leaf node there. And then we have the rest of the data, which we could split again. Oops, I didn't mean to erase it. Um, which we could split again and end up with a leaf node there and then take the remaining data and split that. So basically, decision trees allow you to keep on splitting the data so that you can essentially end up with grids that separate the data. Yes? How did you get the first split? Was it something that we give it or was it, was it based on like all the split, like using Genie and Purity or Entropy or one of the metrics that we've talked about. And we've only talked about Genie and Purity so far, but we'll, we're about to talk about some other ones, including the one you have to use in your homework, which is called Information Game. Yes? No, so these are two features, x1 and x2. But remember when we were talking about the continuous valued inputs where you could split on multiple points of the input. So you could have, um, for uh, temperature, you could have one node that does temperatures less than 12.5, but then have another node much lower down the tree that's temperature greater than 90.8, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess this is for, you could think of this as splitting for multiple values for these continuous variables or you, categorical variables are not always binary often they have multiple potential values so you could split at various um, bound, various values of the categorical variable yeah so genie and purity is splitting it on whatever value is whatever field is most even of oh, sorry whatever field is most even uh, the, the op opposite. You know, so it's looking at when you, sp what, what's the field so that if you split it, it's gonna put the outcome variable uh, most in one split and least in the other okay. split. You're trying to make conclusions, right, based off of it. Yeah, so Gini and Purity is like one quantitative way of looking at um, things, but we're also gonna talk about a couple other ones. Let's do that now. So one popular splitting metric, well, let's just clarify that there's many possible splitting metrics. We've only talked about genie and purity. For your homework, you're gonna use a different splitting metric. Um, so one popular splitting metric that's used for a bunch of things in data science, not just for construction of decision trees um, is the concept of entropy. And entropy is also a thing in physics, although don't think about that today. Um, so entropy is defined, and it's often, H is often used to abbreviate entropy for kind of non 
relevant reason, so don't worry about it, but it's, the convention is to use H. Um, and it's defined as the probability times log base two of the probability of a variable where n equals the number of classes. And we're gonna do an example where we work out entropy as usual, I think that's the easiest way to understand these formulae. But conceptually, you could think of entropy as the disorder or um, uh, information theoretic interpretation, which is kind of not super important, but it's the number of bits required on average to encode information. There's other interpretations, but um, those are roughly the interpretations. And as an example, high entropy can mean a high, one second, high level of uncertainty. So we could also use uncertainty as an other, probably a, the best interpretation. So a high level of uncertainty. So for example, if you have a probability distribution of 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%, that's high entropy because you don't know what value your variable is going to take. opposed to low entropy, which is a low level of uncertainty. So for example, if you have a variable and there's 97% chance that it'll take one value and 1% chance that it will take the other values. Okay, well, there's a question somewhere. Yeah, so probability of x of i times log base 2 of probability of x of i. Ah, okay, probability, okay. So for any impurity, you use low, look for the lowest entropy. Um, yes, exactly. So we can write that explicitly. Um, so we split on low entropy, if we were splitting on entropy. Um, sort of an equivalent metric, and again, we'll work out an example of both entropy and this other metric, where the other metric is called information gain. I think it'll be really clear once we work out the example. But information gain is actually defined using entropy. And it actually, it turns out that high entropy means low information gain and vice versa. So when you're constructing a decision tree, it doesn't really matter which one you end up using. Um, but information gain of, of, of your outcome variable, which I'm gonna, I was gonna write it as X, but maybe I'll write it as Y to make it less, make it clear that it's the outcome variable. Um, Condition on an attribute is equal to the entropy of that outcome variable minus the entropy of that outcome variable given the different, the attribute that you're splitting on. Um, so conceptually, you could think of this as the expected reduction in entropy from splitting on an example. So we're about to do an example, which will make this really clear. But yes? Can you say what y and a is again? Yeah, let me go through the example. Oh, I so think that'll make y, it clear. Like, y is the example that 
why is that has a low level of uncertainty? I don't understand. So why not? Yeah, so low level of uncertainty because you know with a high probability that this variable is going to take value A as opposed to value B, C, or D. Whereas for low entropy, there's you don't know if your variable is going to take value A or value B or value C or value D. They're all kind of equally likely. So you have a high level of uncertainty about the value it's going to take because it's they're all the values it can take are equally likely. Yeah, so high, high entropy, high level of uncertainty, low entropy, low level of uncertainty. So you could think of entropy as uncertainty. If it's easier to... Oh, so it's kind of like physics or high entropy means more chaos. Yes, yeah, exactly. But for those who don't know physics, it might be confusing to talk about that. But yes, it's exactly... It's you are into physics. Um, okay, let's work through an example, and I think this will be crystal clear with an example. And to make this even better, let's go through the example of question three of the homework. Not the whole homework, but just the first part of it. So I'm kind of giving you the first part of doing homework three, which I feel like is pretty generous, but I don't know. Let's do it anyways. It's kind of just I was too lazy to find another example. <laughs> so I was like, let me just do the homework. Uh, so example, um, first thing, let's, let's look at. So in homework three, we're trying to predict. It's kind of a morbid example, but predict whether a self-driving airplane will crash given a few attributes of the airplane. So whether it's foggy, whether there's excess gasoline, whether the runway is too close, and whether the plane is too high. I think I was on an airplane when I came up with this question, uh, which is kind of not good. Uh, but, um, so we might want to, for example, calculate the entropy of the excess gasoline variable. Um, so the entropy of so if we want to know if we want to split on excess gasoline, we could calculate the information gain of excess gasoline, and in particular, the information gain of the crash variable um, and excess gasoline. Um, so the first thing we can do is, let's recall that the information gain of of the crash variable, so that's the y, and excess gasoline, just using the formula for information gain, is equal to the entropy of crash minus the entropy of crash given excess gasoline So let's calculate each of these terms. We can start with the entropy of crash, which let's recall the formula for entropy, this negative sum over the probability of each uh, class or value that the variable can take times log base 2 of that same probability. So for crash, we see that cra the there's four examples where crash is yes and two examples where crash is no. So there's a four out of six probability that crash is yes and a two out of six probability that crash is no. Do we have to show the calculation for the homework that we have? Yeah. Okay. I mean, you have to do the algebra, but at least write it out. Um, so that would be negative... So the first probability of crash, 4 out of 6 times log base 2, 4 out of 6. And we add that through the summation for the other possible outcome, 2 out of 6 times log base 2 of 2 out of 6. And that happens to come out to 0 0.918. So we have the first term, 
to calculate the second term, it's slightly more involved, but not too much more involved. So the entropy of crash conditioned on excess gasoline is going to be, well, first we want to look at if excess gasoline, so excess gasoline could take two values. It could be yes, or it can be no. And we want to calculate the entropy of each of these situations. So when excess gasoline is yes, that there's four data points where excess gasoline is yes. And we want to look at when is crash yes and when is crash no in each of those scenarios. So when excess gasoline is yes, that's four situations. There's two of those situations where crash is yes and two of those situations where crash is no. So the entropy comes out to be two out of four times log base two of two out of four plus two out of four times log base two of two out of four, um, which ends up being, uh, well, I won't, we don't need to worry about what it actually comes out to be. Um, for no, it's, uh, so when excess gasoline is no, that's two data points, and we see that both of those data points have crash equals yes. So that makes it easy. It's two out of two times log base two of two out of two plus zero out of two times log base two of zero out of two and uh, we want to weight these for our final conditional entropy calculation. We want to weight them by uh, the number of examples in each category. So we want to weight this by four of the examples in each category. And here there's two examples where excess gasoline is no. And so if we add up these two terms, Add up the two terms, then our final value is. Uh, So you're weighing it by the total number of points that are yes, excess gasoline, or no, excess gasoline. So four out of six of the points have yes, excess gasoline, and two out of the six points have no, excess gasoline. So are you saying then that excess gasoline is the first one you want to switch on? No, I, you're going to, for the homework, you're going to have to do this for the other variables as well and determine which one has the you know, lowest entropy or maximal information gain, whichever one. You could just use entropy, by the way, which might be a little easier. So the, uh, whichever one has the highest entropy is one you put on. Yes, or lowest entropy, highest information gain. Which is the same thing, it turns out. Yeah. Could you give us like some intuition on where these formulas come from, like how they derive? Just some yeah. insight into because you just kind of gave it to us. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to go too much into it, but basically, uh, if you play around with the entropy equation, uh, it gives you a value between for in the binary case between zero and one. 
and you can put in, I, what I recommend to build up intuition for this is plug in 0 0.5 for the probabilities and see what that gives you and then plug in you know, one probability being 0 0.99 and the other probability being 0 0.01 and see what that gives you. There is a mathematical derivation for entropy and it's based on this mathematical notion of surprise or what's the surprise of the variable. But I don't want to get into that in this class. It's kind of a, um, this is just one of those things where uh, I made the executive decision that it's not worth getting too much into because it's kind of a tangent. The one below would be on information gain. Information gain. So if you accept the formula for entropy, it's telling you, given that there's a certain amount of entropy of your output variable, and you remove, and now you split on the, a, a particular attribute, like excess gasoline, or a particular input, you can think of the A as also a input, like X, then uh, what is the difference in entropy going to be? So if you have the same entropy, then your information gain is going to be zero because you have the same amount of uncertainty whether you split on that variable or not versus if that second term is almost as high as the first term, which means that the entropy or the uncertainty of the of the output variable when you split on the particular input variable is um, roughly similar than uh, the, in or sorry, it's really low. So there's low uncertainty afterwards and high uncertainty before, then you're gonna get a high amount of information gain. So it's kind of, the English term information gain is kind of roughly what you, it's, it's meant to be a conceptual term. It's, it's exactly what it describes. It's what's the increase in information or the gain in information based on, what's, based on the change in uncertainty when you split on a variable versus you still not. Back up. I wanted to see that, the, equation, the original, the, sorry, the calculation you did based on uh, excess gasoline. OK. Yeah, and that has to do with, I mean, the reason the negative's there, it's kind of a tangent, but the log of a probability is going to be a negative number, so to undo that. Because when I put that into Wolfram Alpha, I get something very different than what you get. Uh, yeah. I get 0 0.2764. Are you, what, are you using base 2? Base 2 log. Oh, wait, let's see, that wasn't base 2. Okay. Now, um, yes, now I get the same thing. I thought it was using base two before. Cool. Um, any other questions on that? Um, so yeah, I mean, I recommend, yeah, basically there's this formula here, but basically in terms of intuition, just think about it like this. When all the values that a variable could get are the same, you have high uncertainty and uh, uncertainty synonym for entropy um, when you have when you're pretty certain that the variable is going to take one value versus the others it's going to be low entropy or low uncertainty because you're certain that the variable is going to take that value and there's a quantitative definition for it so, that, so that's a value um, is the information gain that you were calculating with the log the 0.918 that's an information gain amount 0 0.918 would be the entropy of crash. So it's the first term. That's the entropy. Because you want to see what's the entropy before you split, what's the entropy after you split. If, they're the, if it's just as much uncertainty after you split, it's not a good split. So then, um, kind of. Yeah, maybe. So let me annotate. Before split, uh, before split. Yeah, we could annotate this. So it's. Can help. So entropy, or let's just call this uncertainty slash entropy before. Well, that's not before. Before 
you split and uncertainty slash entropy after you split. And so if there's a lot of uncertainty after you split, your information gain is going to be zero or low because you didn't learn anything. You're just as uncertain afterwards as beforehand. Whereas if you do split and now you're, you have a low level of uncertainty, your information gain is going to be high because the difference between how much uncertainty you had when you started and where you ended up is... Value of information is the entropy of the crash. It's just this first term. It's oh. entropy of crash. H of crash. Okay. Oh, the value, value of the crash. Yeah, the uncertainty of crash, basically. Nope, just just the uncertainty, just the entropy. Uh, this, my mind's so I recommend this is one thing that's nice to marinate a while. It's um, if you want to, you know, really get into probability and other types of uncertainty in data science. It's really good to understand entropy, um, but for the purposes of this class, I think just understanding it at this level is good enough. Yeah, sure. Um, OK, so let's cover um, decision trees for regression. And there's actually not too much to cover here. But let's say you wanted to predict not a Variable, but a continuous number when you do regress when you build a decision tree um, there's a few changes to make so first of all for the homework to how many people used a regression decision tree okay so the way that worked is a very similar process except there's a few changes so basically everything from above except use mean square error or sum of square error, kind of the same thing in terms of maximization and minimization. Um, instead of information gain, genie impurity, or entropy. So you use a regression metric. How different is what you wanted to predict from what the true value is? Because we're doing regression, not classification. And the um, prediction, so what you actually predict at a leaf node is going to be the average of in a particular split. Um, the average of the values you're trying to predict, or the outcome values in a particular split. And because um, you know, it's going to be a little different than classification, because in classification, when you split the data points, you can stop when all points in one category are one in one side are one category and the other side are a different category that doesn't quite work for regression because every data point is going to have probably a different numerical value so you can stop you can use some other stopping criteria so you can stop when the number of points in a node is below a predefined threshold so a hyperparameter that you can define. Or 
if you exceed some number of iterations. You can actually stop on these criteria um, for classification trees as well, but um, you kind of have to stop on something like this because there's, it's very unlikely that two points are going to have exactly the same value. So you can't just stop when all points have the same value because one point might have 93.347 and the other one might have 93.349. And that'd probably be a good place to stop. Just take the average of those, but they're not going to be the same. That's basically all there is to it. Any questions on regression trees? Making that switch from classification to regression? OK. The next. Oh, I think one of the issues I had with this was like trying to, because it was very easy to get your mean squared error like very very low, mm -hmm. um, but then obviously like you're just overfitting the data because you could just create you just split it and create a huge decision tree. Yeah, you could do this on steroids. Like yeah, you. right. So like, how do you like? I guess like, what is the the right way to like where you want a mean squared error to at least like have some value without being you know way too low. Um, yeah, so, so basically regularization for decision trees. Right, like where's the kind of the sweet spot of that, if yes. that makes sense. Yeah, so Can that. Say prediction is an average of, of values in the split? Yes, that's, that's so that's a good question. We're going to cover that now. So that the next topic is random forests, which address exactly the point you brought up. So great segue. No, no, okay. no I was just trying, to, just trying to read the second point you had on the board. Um, so random forests uh, can more broadly be uh, they're more broadly what we're covering is a general ca uh, class of learning algorithms called ensemble ensemble learning and ensemble learning can be applied to decision trees but it doesn't have to be but when it is applied to decision trees that's called a random forest so the general idea in the case of a random forest so the general idea is to one, build many decision trees. I'm going to put an asterisk here. And then two, take the majority vote. And the asterisk is that there are many ways to build multiple decision trees. So for example, going back to healthcare, you might have a tree that looks like this for, and I don't know what I drew there. Uh, so this tree might predict cancer for one data point. You might build a second tree, this is abstract right now, um, that predicts no cancer. And then a third tree that predicts, just drawing different types of binary trees, it's not specific. This third tree might predict cancer, and so your final ensemble learning model would predict cancer because two out of the three of the models predicted cancer. That's the high level idea. And there's many 
algorithms that fit this framework, and we're going to cover two broad categories. The first is called bagging. So bagging, which stands for bootstrapped aggregating. So B A G G I N G. That's how the name was formed. Again, if you create these, you can name them whatever you want. Um, so bagging. And so the steps of bagging are step one to bootstrap, which is a fancy word for sample with replacement. So sample with replacement means you could sample something and you put it back in the deck and you could you have a chance of choosing that same card from the deck. Um, so bootstrap the data set into M boot strapped data sets kind of a infinite loop definition there but let's uh let's look at an example so let's say this is your original data set and we have i'm going to draw the colors as the output class, although it's not super important. Um, so there's, I'm just labeling the points, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So nine data points in the original data set. And after bootstrapping, so sampling, let me draw a better arrow, sampling with replacement multiple times, we might get bootstrap one, Boot strap one. That looks like we might randomly choose a one the first time, then we randomly choose another element that might be happen to, that might happen to be four. Then we randomly choose another element that might happen to be six. Then we randomly choose another element that might happen to be six again. Then we randomly choose another element that might happen to be nine. Then we randomly choose another element that might happen to be two. That's one bootstrap. We do this multiple times for M bootstraps. Probably at this point, you already see where this is going, but let's just do this whole example. So for the, you know, one more time, we choose a random data point that might happen to be three, choose another random data point that might be happen to be three, choose another random data point that might happen to be two, choose another random data point that might happen to be seven, choose another random data point that might happen to be eight, choose another random data point that might happen to be four. So you've built a bunch of bootstrap independent data sets um, from your original data set. So you've created several versions of your data set. Um, step two is to train a model. So IE, actually, IE means in other words, which is not right. I should use EG, which means for example. So for example, a decision tree um, on each boot strapped sample. So for example, on that first bootstrap, data set with one, two, four, six, six, nine. 
we will train one model. See, I really care about this lesson, so I'm drawing it out. Um, and then we'll do that for each of the bootstrapped data sets. And we'll end up with M models, one per bootstrapped data set. Three, three, two, seven, eight, four. Okay. And then we take the majority vote of each of those models. So step three, take the majority vote of each of the models. So, for example, model one might be, might say cancer. Model two, and we've already done this, but it's okay. Model two might say no cancer. And model three might say cancer. And so we take the majority vote and we output cancer. So it doesn't matter if like each of the models are like wildly different from each other? So what do you mean by wildly different? Like because so because you're dividing your master data set into these smaller data sets, so like the pattern or whatever can whatever model would fit into each of those bootstrapped data set might be different, right? Like like the fit or that is. Yeah, exactly. And so the whole point of doing this, um, so zooming back out, why are we doing all this? Um, if you train on just one version of your data set, you're very likely to overfit to that data set. Um, you're learning exactly the data points that you happen to collect, but you could have collected those data points instead. It's reasonable if you just collected a slightly different subjects or humans who you're collecting data from, you might have ended up with that data set or a data set that looks like it. You might have ended up with a that data set. And so you're basically creating many variations of your original data set, and which are all plausible variations because they're just samples of your original data set. And then if you train a model on each of them and take the average, you're making your model more robust to random variation to overfitting to things like that. Um, I have one more question. So in astronomy, I've seen this, this is like dependent on whoever is working with the model, but in machine learning, is there, is there a specific size ratio with the original data set to consider when you're taking your bootstrap data sets? That's a good question. So the question was, one of the comments I got was to repeat questions. So the question was, uh, is how do you choose the size of the bootstrapped uh, data set? Uh, and it, it really depends on what types of models you're creating. So if you're creating lightweight models, like a decision tree stump, or just a, a decision tree with a low max depth, then maybe you'll bootstrap a smaller sample. But if you think about combinatorics, like if you have 1,000 choose 30, there's many bootstrapped examples you can get like, what is 1,000 choose 30? Does anyone know off the top? No, I'm just kidding. 1,000 choose 30 is already, I'm not connected to the internet, but this is a important thing because, well, yeah. It's going to have, like, only the no. digits, right? Yeah. yeah, it's like 10 raised to 57. Yeah. So at 10 choose 30 already, if you're only, if your original data set's 1,000, it's pretty small. So 1,000 times choose 30. Yeah, and so what if it was like 5,000, choose 100, then that's, you know, 211 zeros. 
And I think there's like 87 zeros for the number of atoms in the universe. So, you know, there's a lot of possibilities for bootstrapping. So you, um, it, it allows you to generate a lot of possible data sets. Um, so uh, this is a, kind of a generally important data science. So the question is, are each of these bootstrapped data sets independent? Yeah. They're dependent on the original data set, but they're independent of each other. That's, how does that correlate with the sampling? No, that's, that's just that's, the case because of the way you're sampling. Yes. So with, with replacement means that you take, you, it, it's literally like you take a card out of a deck and then you put it back in the deck. And then the next time you sample or pull a card out of the deck, you, you have a chance of pulling that card out. If you do without replacement, you run out of yeah. cards. I don't know, uh, the of that, but I don't yeah. know what, uh, oh, why do we do sampling with replacement? So, Yes. Um, so sampling. So the question is, what are? Why do we sample with replacement as opposed to without replacement? If we sampled without replacement, if as we approach, if we the bootstrapped data set size approaches the size of the original data set, then uh, you just have the same data set. You didn't really get anything different. Whereas if you bootstrap with replacement, if you repeat uh, data point a few times, well, you still get a data set with a different property. So it helps build variability in the data sets. Is this applicable to regression as well? Yeah, you can do bagging to any type of machine learning problem. And in fact, that's a good lead in to the next point, which is that when we apply bootstrapping, To decision trees, that's what we call a random forest. But we call that a random forest. Um, but you can do this with other types of models as well. So, but can also bootstrap. with other types of models. So you can, for example, have a logistic regression model that outputs cancer, like the one we built in class. You might have a K nearest neighbors model output no cancer. You might have a decision tree output cancer. And you might have, see all these cool models we've learned already? You might have a naive Bayes model output cancer. And so your meta model, your ensemble model, will then predict cancer because three out of the four models predicted cancer. One other, um, and this would not be called a random forest because only one of the models is a decision tree. Um, but in addition to looking at a subset of the data points, so in addition, to looking at a subset of data points. Um, you could each model can also look at a subset of features as well. So 
in addition to getting variability from bootstrapping the data points themselves, you could also say this decision tree is only going to consider this 30% of the original features. I know in class we always draw x1, x2, but in the real world there's like x1 through x10,000. And you say, I'm only going to use 30% of those x axes for this, um, this first bootstrap example. And the second one will only use a different 30% of the features. And that allows you to get even more variability across the models. Um, so an important note, and this is just a general data science lesson, but also kind of like a regular science lesson, um, is that bootstrapped analyses. How many people want to be data scientists? OK. How many people want to do science with data? OK. Oh, OK, more. OK, that's good to know, actually. Um, so bootstrapped analyses apply in both cases. So if you're just, you're not a data scientist, but you're a si regular scientist, and you happen to use data for your science, it's not clear how that's different from data science, but technically different. Um, well, data science can be used for non-science things as well. Um, so bootstrapped analyses are common um, in data science. And regular science. I don't know. If that's regular science, which is arguably different. Um, so, for example, let's look at it in a in a science. Well, actually, let's say you're building two models, and you're trying to compare them. That's a common thing to do when you write a research paper. You have like the status quo, the control, and you have the model you build. And apparently, the model you build is better than the status quo. There's a bunch of papers written that way. Um, but it doesn't have to be models. It could also be you have your people who are in one group and people who are in the other group. And you give one group the drug, and the other group doesn't get, the, get it. And then you want to see, is there differences? This also applies in that case. Um, so as an example, we have model A's F1 score, which might be 0 0.853. The numbers don't really matter. Just an example. And model B's F1 score might be 0 0.892. And the question is, how do we know that this difference is not due to random chance. Because a lot of times in these papers, someone will be like, oh yeah, my model is like 4% better than the previous model, and therefore it's so much better. But what if that difference was due to random chance? So what we can do to solve that problem, in which not all research papers do, but what we could do is to um, bootstrap the test set, or whatever you're measuring, and report not just the mean, or not just the value, but report the mean plus or minus the standard deviation. These are just general things you report in science of the bootstrapped data sets. So you could get, the reason this is important is you might have case one where model A and model B have, let's use the same mean, 0 0.853, 0 0.892, plus or minus, so this is the standard deviation, 0 0.0001 in both cases. 
or you can have model A and model B 0 0.853, 0 0.892, plus or minus 0 0.06 and 0 0.07. Um, now in the first case, making a little plot, we might have model A and model B. Model A is a little bit lower, but if we plot the error bars, they don't overlap. So we're pretty confident that it's an actual difference. Whereas same means, but in this case, if you have error bars like this, yeah, the mean's different, but we don't really, we're not really confident that there's a difference there. So really important lesson, not specific to machine learning, just whenever, I mean, for your final project, keep this in mind, but uh, uh, just in life, keep this in mind because people, you know, 3% difference doesn't mean much if you don't report the standard deviation. And if you only have one data point, you can bootstrap to generate your examples that you take the standard deviation of. So any questions about that life lesson that happens to be applicable to machine learning? Cool. OK, so there's one other zoning out, or zooming out. Um, one other type of ensemble learning that I want to cover, and that is called boosting. So boosting is where we iteratively fit models which prioritize misclassified data points in a previous iteration in the previous iteration. Um, and there's many types of boosting models. And I would love to cover all of them, but let me just give you one algorithm for boosting, which is a relatively popular one called AdaBoost. But there's like Gradient Boost and XGBoost, and those are kind of cool too because they're related to gradient descent. But don't have time to cover everything in this class, but I think this general one will give you the big picture. And if you're interested, you can look at other boosting algorithms. So this is just one example of a boosting algorithm that happens to be pretty popular. I think it's in scikit-learn and everything. Um, so first step is that you initialize the weights of all the data set points, of all the data points, to be equal. By the way, there's all these formulas in AdaBoost, but I'm just going to cover it at a high level. I don't think the formulas teach you anything. And there's, again, many ways to do it, so no point in giving you formulas that happen to work when there's no conceptual gain in covering the formulas. So, you know, we might have eight data points in our data set, and uh, we would give them equal weights. So just dividing by eight, because there's eight data points. And let's say, I don't even know what we're, let's say we're predicting gender, so 
possible genders that could be predicted. And um, so we initialize all the weights. And then for some number of rounds, so this is the iterative part, first thing we do is train a model per feature which only uses that feature. Very important point, which only uses that feature. So for example, you might have, is the color, I don't know, hair, for example, brown, yes or no? And you might have, is the height less than 65? I know, I know, that's kind of a lame example for that reason. Um, so you might split it. So color equals brown might not have anything to do with gender, and so it splits up the uh, data points evenly, so there's no information gain, that's to say. Um, but maybe height might in your data sets that you happen to collect might split things up better. And so, you know, things might be split in that way. Um, and, you know, what I drew up here on the top for step one is the true class. And in the bottom, I drew what how they're predicted, but the colors are still the true class. Um, so what we can do is choose the model with the lowest weighted error. With lowest weighted error, weighted by a concise way to say the weights of the data points. Okay, I'll just write that. Weighted by the weights of the data points. So in this case, we select height less than 65. And then the last step in this iteration is to update the weights of each data point um, so there's a formula for this but basically what it's doing is increase or exactly what it's doing is increase the weight if incorrectly predicted, so if it's an incorrectly predicted data point, you increase the weight and you decrease otherwise. So for example, in the height is less than 65 decision stump, we would Yes, we might down, down weight those and up weight that and down weight those points and up weight that point. So the ones that were incorrectly classified are prioritized for the next iteration. Um, so that when you do this step of choose the model with the lowest weighted error, the error is weighted by what's the weight of those data points from the previous iteration. And then finally, so zooming out of that for loop, the final model, oh, 
add some space so it doesn't run into the tree. Final model is a combination of models from rounds one through n, which are weighted based on the error of that round. So if a model did poorly for a round, it doesn't have as much say in the final classification. So for example, if you have, let's say, a random forest with five decision stumps, which are decision trees with just one decision, which is what we use in a in add a boost. And let's say the weights are I don't know, something like this. weighted by the error at the round, and maybe these two models predict male, and these two models predict female. So because of the weightings, the final prediction, even though there's more trees that predicted male, the final prediction is female because of the weights of those trees. And that is basically how Attaboost works. And again, there's mathematical details. Um, the uh, reasoning for this is very similar to bagging. You're creating many different versions of the models, but what makes boosting sometimes work better in some cases is that uh, it's weighting each of the models by the error in each round, whereas in the baseline version of bagging does not do that. But it's the same type of idea. You build a bunch of individual models that gives you robustness um, so that you're not overfitting to your original data set as badly as you would if you just had one model. It's a way to generalize. Yes? just above where you have the bigger circle, why is the colors different than the previous step? Um, the colors are flipped, aren't they? Oh, uh, yeah. On the, 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 the part on the... Yeah, let's just yes. switch that. Oh. Yeah, there, that fixes that. No, that's what I meant, the colors are flipped, right? So for oh, well, top is, is N Y. Oh, okay. Oh wait, I was right the first time. Sorry, it was right the first time. It's the same. Yeah, because yes, for height is less than sixty-five. There are three blues, one red, three blues, one red, and reverse for no. So yeah, you're just because. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So because the uh, blue ones on the when height is less than 65 is equal to yes, are correctly classified, they get less weight, they're not as important in measuring the error in the next round because they were already correctly classified. And we want a model that's going to get those ones that were previously incorrectly classified, correctly classified in the next round. So there's no gas for both, right? Yeah, so it's like if you did, if you were predicted, if you're a data point that was predicted poorly, we'll make sure you that our models do better the next round on you. So no data point gets left behind. Okay. Yes. Question. Um, I just was trying to figure out how the, um, so you, with the question three, way back earlier, with the app, with like poker tree, like, okay, the app, um, let's, uh, let's end the class now, and then why don't you ask me individually. All right, see you all next week. Have a nice weekend.